This is Philip John Usher of NYU's Department of French Literature, Thought, and Culture. Places for Thinking, La Tour, Boccaccio, Marguerite de Navarre. To think in pandemic times is to pursue thought during, alongside, or despite the pandemic, whether or not one is thinking about it. To think pandemic times without the preposition is to pursue thought whether or not one is currently living through a pandemic. The fact that the title of this series of podcasts indeed includes the preposition is thus key. How do we think while a pandemic is unfolding around, and indeed in some cases, through us, whether or not we are thinking about it? It is, I think, about care for thinking, even as we care for infected bodies. How can or should we think now in pandemic times if we had to think also after them? In a piece for the French media outlet AOC, the philosopher Bruno Latour called on readers this week to, quote, use this time of imposed confinement to describe that which we truly care about, that to which we are truly attached. He invites us to answer a number of basic questions that might help us think through what could or should happen after the pandemic. To avoid a return to business as usual, something that Latour is against, we must know what we really care about, which parts of pre-coronavirus life really need to be started up again as before. Such a question is, of course, being asked widely, on the left and on the right. See, for example, Matt Stoller's recent piece in The Guardian. The coronavirus relief bill could turn into a corporate coup if we aren't careful. Or still, uh, Jason Wilson's even more recent piece, U.S. far-right seeks ways to exploit coronavirus and cause social collapse. What do I want to start up again after the pandemic is over? Many things, for sure. But because I care for thought, then at the top of the list is universities. Universities, their libraries, their classrooms. Universities, which provide spaces and structures for thinking in society, are, like all institutions, asking hard questions about the future, especially in the light of the undeniable financial realities of education in a capitalist economy. In the US, students pay a lot for education. Over half of the college and university presidents surveyed for a report in this week's Chronicle for Higher Education expect, because of lower enrollments and various other factors, a decrease in revenues of between 10 and 20% next year. 83% have already implemented, or soon plan to, hiring freezes, 55% anticipate layoffs, and 57% plan on furloughs. 30% expect to be hiring more part-time faculty. The question then is, what kind of thinking can happen in pandemic times such that we might still have places for thinking after them? As a scholar of literary history whose work focuses on earlier periods, my mind turns to thinkers of all stripes, authors, artists, architects, and so forth, who were active during an earlier pandemic. For example, the Black Death that ravaged Eurasia in the 14th century. What kind of thinking happened in those pandemic times? Starting in 1348, many medical texts were produced, of course, most famously perhaps the Compendium de Epidemia, written by the masters of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Paris. Meanwhile, certain non-medical thinking and artistic productions were put on pause. Take, for example, the Cathedral of Siena, a useful emblem. A major addition was planned in the late 1330s that would have doubled the Duomo's size. The Black Death quickly halted this, and the expansion was never resumed. Most of the non-medical thinking about these pandemic times was actually produced after the first major outbreaks of the plague, and as a dark shadow that haunted generations and that often morphed into metaphor or allegory. Latour's question, to what are we attached, structures the pandemic thinking of texts such as Boccaccio's 14th century Decameron, as well as its 16th century French imitation, Marguerite de Navarre's Heptameron. Boccaccio's work stages ten characters who tell stories to each other while hunkering down in a secluded villa on the outskirts of Florence in order to flee the Black Death. The prologue especially is worth rereading in our present moment. The echoes with what we read daily of the coronavirus are indeed eerie. Regarding the play's first arrival in Europe from Asia, Boccaccio writes how, in 1348, in the illustrious city of Florence, the fairest of all cities of Italy, there made its appearance that deadly pestilence which had its origin some years before in the East. We hear echoes of Trump's claim that this is a, quote, foreign virus, something coming from the outside. Boccaccio also describes the various measures taken to halt the phenomenon, also strikingly familiar. The cleansing of the city, the refusal of entrance to all sick folk, and the adoption of many precautions for the preservation of health. We could also quote Boccaccio's description of the plague symptoms, as well as his summary of the growing difficulty of what to do with dead bodies, 
He talks about the porters, the singing bikini or cemetery workers, the lack of consecrated ground, all of which echoes all too loudly the arrival on New York streets of refrigerated trucks employed as temporary morgues. Following this focus on the pandemic, however, the Decameron next turns away from it. It is time to flee the city, and thus seven women and three men leave Florence for the countryside. In the words of the Decameron's Pampinea, I should deem it most wise if we were to quit this place, di questa terra uscissimo, and betake ourselves to the country, and there live on one of the estates, with all cheer of festal gathering and other delights. There we shall hear the chant of birds, gli uccelletti cantare, have sight of verdant hills and plains, of cornfields undulating like the sea, i campi pieni di biadi non altramenti ondeggiare che il mare, of trees of a thousand hues. Such exile is idyllic. The estate lay upon a little hill some distance from the nearest highway, he continues, and embowered in shrubberies of diverse hues and other greenery afforded the eye a pleasant prospect. On the summit of the hill was a palace with galleries, halls and chambers, disposed around a fair and spacious court. Un palagio con bello e gran cortile nel mezzo e con loggie e con sale e con camere. Each very fair in itself and the goodlier to see for the gladsome pictures with which it was adorned. There's plenty of wine, beds already made, and rooms swept and garnished with flowers. Who would not wish pandemic exile to resemble this? Such is not the situation of most of the people I know thinking or trying to think in the era of the coronavirus. Still, let's ask what kind of thinking the fleers of Florence imagined. Pampinea again speaks. If you take my advice, you will find pastime for the hot hours before us, not in play, but in telling of stories, ma novelando in which the invention of one may afford solace to all the company of its hearers. Thus is born the Decameron, which, thanks to the frame tale, partly adapted from an 8th century text by Paul the Deacon, but ostensibly adapted to fit the historical realities of the 14th century Black Death, gathers together 100 moral tales, stories of saints, ribald fables of adultery, and much more. Thinking in pandemic times thus means here turning the pandemic into a frame tale acknowledging it and then setting it to one side in order to think collectively about other things. It also means, or rather requires, a heterotopic other space to which one can flee. Just as Montaigne fled Bordeaux, so thinking here means going elsewhere and having the means to do so. This is fleeing to the Hamptons. And indeed, as we're seeing in our present moment, a pandemic reveals and often increases socioeconomic inequality. Students who used to share classrooms and dormitories and canteens made equal in order to think together now zoom into class from a mansion, a farm, or a cramped apartment with poor internet. We find a similar situation in Marguerite de Navarre's French uh, Decameron, Leptameron, from the middle of the 16th century. This is a masterpiece in its own right, and for many more reasons than I can lay out here. As feminist scholars of the 1980s and 1990s have shown, the Heptameron is a dialogic festival in which misogyny is countered at every turn by savvy respondents. The story that Marguerite imagines in the Heptameron is different, but similar. Here, a group of storytellers seek refuge not from a pandemic, but from torrential rains that make it impossible for them to return home after spending time at a spa town in the Pyrenees. They thus retire to a monastery near to the river that they cannot cross and hunker down, confined, for as long as it takes for the waters to recede or for a bridge to be built. And each day, from noon until 4pm, the group heads to a shaded grove to swap and to discuss stories. I find it interesting that Marguerite, instead of imagining a fictional flood, could have created a French version of the Decameron related to the specifically French context of the Black Death. This is worth lingering over. She might, for example, have drawn on the situation of the port town of Marseille, which, after allowing a ship from Genoa to dock, became the epicenter of contagion in France. About 60% of the city's population died, and much of the port area was set ablaze in an attempt to end the infection. She might have taken as a case the study of the city of Avignon, where, due to the lack of burial grounds, the Rhone River was declared consecrated space, and thus suitable for the disposal of cadavers. She might have set her tales in Bordeaux, another port city hugely affected by the Black Death. Or in Paris, even, whose horrors during the pandemic were described by the Carmelite monk Jean de Venette. She might have drawn heavily on the vernacular Grande Chronique de France, but instead she imagined a flood. As in the Decameron, retreat from difficult times is quite agreeable here. As the character Parlement puts it, 
The trees are so leafy that the sun could neither break through the shade nor warm up the cool freshness. The monastery where they sleep remains in this frame tell a stuffy ecclesiastical space marked by conservative gender politics. The grove, in contrast, is a space for thinking where men and women are equals. There, stories are told and discussed. The topics of Marguerite's tales vary widely, although often have to do with male-female relationships, which are then discussed by the assembled group, referred to as divisant or talkers between stories. These debates between tales are where the thinking really happens, for the divisant frequently disagree about what the tales mean. Stories collide, cancelling each other out. The divisant don't agree about who or what a given tale is about. The female divisant, in particular, are quick to interrogate and to correct the perception of their male companions. Thus, for example, the male storyteller of novella 1, Simon Tau, wants to illustrate how bad women are. He concludes, Just consider now, ladies, je vous supplie, mesdames, the amount of trouble that was caused by one woman. Just think of the whole train of disasters that this one woman's behavior led to. I think you'll agree that ever since Eve made Adam sin, women have taken it upon themselves to torture men. Novella 2, this time told by a female narrator, Wazi, responds to Simonto's misogyny by focusing on female virtue. Or take Novella 7, a story told by a man and named it illustrating, so he thinks, the quick-wittedness of men. Not so, responds Longarin. It is not a tale about the male character's ability to trick an old lady, but a story about the choices made by a young girl. Many more examples could be given. Throughout, the inscribed audience listens and responds actively, answering back and encouraging the book's actual readers to be just as engaged in thought. Whereas Boccaccio's lady listeners often blush or laugh, Marguerite's think, chacune pense ça. In one of the tales, Novella 67, we venture far from France to learn about the fate of a male-female couple who accompanied to Canada a certain Jean-François de la Roque de Robertval, the first lieutenant general of New France. The husband, after betraying Robert Val, is first sentenced to death, then, following his wife's pleas, merely exiled to a deserted island off, to the, off the coast of Newfoundland. Somewhat lo- like what we have in the frame tales of both the Decameron and the Heptameron, this is a story about humans caught up in so-called capital N nature. Husband and wife survive amongst the Bêtes Sauvage, the only other inhabitants of the island, for quite some time. At first menacing, the wild animals become the couple's source of food, deemed bon à manger, good to be eaten. Then things take a turn for the worse. The husband dies after his body swells up from drinking water. À cause de ses eaux qu'il buvait, il devint si enflé que, en peu de temps, il mourut. He's gone. The wife ends up living on her own, with only the wild animals for company, and is eventually saved and taken back to France. The story over, the devisant, as usual, weigh up its possible meanings. Longarine opines, the woman in this story certainly deserves praise, both because she loved her husband and risked her life for him, and because she loved God. And a sweet responds, placing emphasis rather on whether men are worth such devotion in the first place. Provided they don't bite, I prefer the company of wild beasts to the company of men who are bad-tempered and unbearable. In both the Decameron and the Heptameron, then, We have not thinking about pandemic times or about natural disasters such as a flood, but thinking in such times and about other topics. The plague and the flood are occasions for those with means for retreat to agreeable places where thinking can happen, a kind of thinking not unlike that suggested by Latour. What do we most care about? To what are we really attached? Just as Boccaccio's storytellers waited for the plague to pass and Marguerite's de Bison waited for a bridge to be built, so we wait hopefully in safety, for the coronavirus to pass. In the meantime, we might take up Latour's questionnaire and, via Zoom, discuss such matters collectively. Most of us won't be doing this in idyllic landscapes, but the literary landscapes that made thought possible for Boccaccio and Marguerite might stay with us as virtual backgrounds for our thinking. And also as reminders that for thinking to continue after the pandemic, we must care for the structures that make thinking possible. To conclude, let's return to 2020. I haven't been outside in 25 days. I took the trash down to our courtyard once wearing mask and gloves. That's it. It's currently 4.32 a.m. Emails have been sent, Zoom meetings scheduled, and notes for said meetings prepared. I search on, search on Google for the Cathedral of Siena, which I've never visited in person, and take, off, take a virtual walk around to virtually stretch the legs before bed. The planned monumental facade of Siena's cathedral, known as the Facciatone, whose construction was interrupted by the Black Death, looks weirdly dull. 
like something built in concrete in the 1960s. I can't muster much affect at all. This is, after all, now just a parking lot. Or perhaps it's just that the image quality isn't great. But I can't help wondering what the cathedral might have looked like if Giovanni di Agostino's planned extension had been finished. The image of the Facciatoni stands in contrast for me to the landscapes of Boccaccio and Marguerite, standing respectively for structures unfinished because of difficult times and for structures imagined to think in those times. The university shouldn't be an ivory tower, nor should we model it on Boccaccio's Palagio or on Marguerite's Verdant Grove, but I certainly hope that the university won't end up like Siena's Cathedral. What places we will or won't have to think in after the pandemic depends on what thinking we do during it. Thank you for listening. Stay safe.